ladies and gentlemen, but I can say dear friends, I think. I am very happy to welcome you on behalf of the International Humanist and Ethical Union for this meeting, this World Conference on Untouchability. It is normal that an organization as IHEU organizes an event like this, as we are absolute supporters of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it is normal that we are struggling against a caste system. Here in the West, we think of a caste system existing in India, and that's true. It is existing in India, but not only in India. Think of Nepal, think of Japan, think of Nigeria, and think of some Western countries, some, and not that long, 100 years ago, 200 years ago. So we wanted to bring together important people and everybody is important who thinks about problems like um, untouchability, so we are all important, don't forget. We bring them together in the hope that the world would pick up the idea of emancipating all human beings. So I'm very happy to welcome to welcome Lord Desai and Lord Avebury and Mr. Bino Bahadi, who is member of the Constituent Assembly of Nepal. Very much welcome. <laughs> and that is for the first part, at least, of this conference. But I will give over the word to Oak. I have to say, because he looks at me and it will, very, it will be very upset if I don't mention it. It's, uh, we do have a project on Dalit villages. So please, please go back to your countries, tell it to everyone, and try to adopt a Dalit village. It's very important that we do it with uh, the help of uh, all uh, the member organizations of the International Humanist and Ethical Union. So, Babu, now I dare give uh, the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia, distinguished guests, and colleagues in the fight to help restore a sense of dignity amongst the unfortunate communities of people that we call Dalits, which is actually broken people. I think the problem of Dalits and the struggle for the emancipation of the Dalit communities perhaps has been hijacked by those who are seeking media publicity, those who are uniquely interested in harvesting the souls of the Dalits. There might be a different approach to helping Dalits. There might be a secular humanist response to a problem that has been created by religion. Clearly, religion cannot be the solution to the problem it has created. And this we see, not just in India, but in Buddhist countries, in Islamic countries, and as we will learn in the course of today and tomorrow, also in Europe, which was Christian. So clearly, the question, the problem, and the misery of untouchability, <coughs> this pernicious system of discrimination that continues to persist, is not uniquely linked to the geography of the Indian subcontinent or the rotten ideas associated with the Hindu caste system. It is a much larger problem. And it is time for the world to recognize it so on a matter of principle, on a matter of strategy, it is crucial that the world recognize it so, because then it will not be in the domain of a country to say that this is an internal matter relating to the religion that exists in our country. 
and then it becomes a matter for the world. It should prick the conscience of everyone that we have still untouchability going on in the world, that there are 250 million victims of this, that 250 million fellow human beings are considered non-human and not eligible for cultural intercourse with the rest of humanity. I think it's equally a matter of shame that in the name of the untouchables, politicians have been harvesting not their souls but their votes. If we look at how societies have emancipated, if we look at how France and Spain have gotten rid of untouchability to the extent that 300 years after it has been by act of legislation outlawed, that hardly anyone in Europe remembers that there was untouchability in this part of the world. Perhaps there is something for us to learn there. Perhaps it is important that we put emphasis on the emancipation of the Dalits. And emancipation is a personal act. It happens when each individual is able to discover their human dignity by themselves. And that is hardly possible by converting to a religion which then will have houses of prayer meant separately installed for those from the lower caste. We know that in the churches of Kerala, untouchable people who have converted to Christianity go to their own churches and not to the ones meant for everyone. We know that when their souls are not being harvested by religion, their votes are being harvested by politicians, and that has changed nothing for them. There is a chief minister in the largest state of India, which outnumbers many Indian, many European countries put together in population. There is a chief minister that has changed nothing for the plight of the Dalits in the state. There are a number of politicians who are now members of the Indian parliament, of legislatures. That has changed nothing in a real way for these people. It has perhaps given them a bit of positive discrimination. A few crumbs <coughs> have been thrown. But as Mary Wollstonecraft a long time ago told us, what we need is not charity, what we need is justice. <coughs> and when you want justice, you want it on the modern ideals of the Enlightenment, a discovery of the rational values, of equality, of secularism. None of these are being fulfilled in the present activity and activism that is directed towards the liberation of the Dalits from their utter misery. This conference, friends, is a response to the rather insipid and unexciting activity of converting people to other religions, of doling out charity, and inviting friends in the Dalit community to discover with us the liberating ideas, values, and method of science, of reason, of democracy, and of modern human rights. This conference brings together giants in the field of human rights. They are probably not known to the Western media because we have never cultivated them. But these are people who know the heart of the Dalit and who have lived the life of the Dalits and know where liberation exists and where liberation resides. And that is in the Dalits discovering for themselves what their rightful entitlements are. Not in the eyes of some as sinners by birth, not in the eyes of some as where the brotherhood of humankind is discovered and understood without accepting the sisterhood of womankind. We are talking about the secular approach, secular activism, human rights activism, and we are talking about trying to create a forum for those who are secularly minded to come together and to enable by creating a forum for interaction those who are secular-minded Dalits, so that they have an alternative. We want also to remind our friends that merely being represented in legislators, 
will not change the plights of the Dalits. The only way that the Dalits will be emancipated is how other societies have liberated themselves through discovering modern values. And we would like to establish that. And we want to create with this conference the nucleus of secular activism, which will be, we hope, a kind of pointer for those who are similarly inclined. It is not as if the Dalit community did not produce these liberating ideas themselves. One of the greatest of the greats of the last century, Dr. Ambedkar, is now merely a mascot and an icon for reaping votes. His ideas, his secular ideas, his rational ideas, his courage, his willingness to examine the claims of religion are now put on the back burner by the very Dalit leaders who have been elected to power. There is an artificial atmosphere of confrontation that has been set up internationally as if this is a fight and a battle against the government. How ridiculous it is to make the claim on a government about reforming society. Societies don't get reformed by legislation. Societies get reformed through a process of education. And yet, because it is easy to scandalize a government, people have, I believe, sidetracked the issue. In India, the abuse of the rights of Dalits is unacceptable. But that abuse largely comes from fellow citizens, not from the government. And they must be brought to justice. There are 10,000 cases that are instituted, perhaps, in the country. <coughs> there are none in Nigeria, despite the law being in existence for 50 years. There is no punishment prescribed for treating someone as an untouchable in Japan. Perhaps there is something to learn from the Indian experience, rather than simply bashing one country all the time. Perhaps governments, academics, human rights activists, secularists, have something to learn from the experiences of Europe where they got rid of it. We hope that this conference will provide the opportunity to do so. As I said, we have some giants in this room. We have Yogesh Varhade, we have Mahanandiyaji, we have V.B. Rawat, we have Viraswami. Viraswami liberated 52,000 acres of land for the use of Dalits by moving the bureaucratic system and persistently working in the community. He is the one who rescued a woman, a Dalit woman who was accused of being a witch and almost killed. They held her, they found her bleeding in a village and they rescued her and brought her back to the community. It is people like this who are the real leaders of Dalit communities. It is not the ones who lobby at the UN or the ones who work in Europe it is not the email tigers who are around sending emails around. There are people who are doing grassroots level work. And we would like our conference and we would like our activism to be an invitation to these people who perhaps are not media savvy, but who have changed their societies in very clear ways and for lasting effect.